Good afternoon. Good evening to a few of you. Welcome to today's community briefing. My name is Gregory Sneed, and we are glad you are here today. Oh, man, let's see if yours is right. Well, let's see. We got to mute some people there. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, today is the 23rd of February in 2023, and our guest today is an individual formerly known as Danny Tabor. He is now Dr. Daniel Tabor. And he'll be uh, joining us uh, very shortly to share some good educational information uh, about what he's doing and how that is helping the community. Uh, my name is Gregory Sneed. Name of my company is Lifesaver Financial Services, where I help my clients keep more of the money they make. I do that through life insurance solutions, financial coaching, personal financial coaching, financial literacy. And I've just added a new program to help people get their will and estate and uh, trust documents. I've uh, just partnered with an organization to be able to get uh, help people to get that done at a pretty affordable rate. So that is new and improved. And so now it's my pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, the queen <laughs> of our community briefing, Miss Crystal Mitchell. Good morning, guys. Another great Thursday with rain. Um, at least we have rain and not blizzards like they are having all across the northern part of this country. And so, but very cold, <laughs> very cold. Um, I, I Someone put on a post yesterday that it, they were in Vegas and they said it was so cold they were going to bed because they thought the cold was coming right through their walls <laughs> and they felt they needed to be in their covers. So welcome to the community briefing. My name is Crystal Mitchell, as Greg uh, indicated. I am the co-director of Recycling Black Dollars and the inspiration behind the community briefing. Uh, this platform was created so that we would know exactly who our uh, leaders and stakeholders in our community. And hopefully that means they're bringing us firsthand information that is uh, pertinent to us making better decisions for our business. It is a networking platform. It actually replaces Recycling Black Dollars once a, once a month breakfast mixer. Uh, you now do breakfast at your own house, but you meet with us and it's been pretty awesome. So we want to thank you guys. Um, for joining us. Uh, in addition to the community briefing, I do uh, another show called The Business Zone with Crystal and G Gilbert. Uh, I have the philosophy that if we're not going to read it, then I know we'll listen to it. So if it's media, we shall hear it. And that's what my plan is to make sure that I'm getting the message out to our community uh, through whatever medium that will you guys will resonate with and change and start recycling your dollars and supporting our community and our leaders. Uh, so with that, we have a fantastic team, Mr. Gregory Sneed, uh, who's our MC, um, Mr. Stephen Turner, who is our producer, and Ms. Robin Billups and myself. And we are here to bring you information that will help you um, know more of what's going on in our community. Hey, Joe, haven't seen you in a while. Uh, good to see you and everyone else that's been coming to join us. We have a fantastic guest, as Greg said, Dr. Daniel Tabor. And uh, so we're going to be talking to him on his new uh, milestone and also about all the things that he has done in this community. This is Black History Month. We're coming to a close. And next month, we're going to kick off Women's History Month. Uh, so we're going to do that with a bang as well, have some incredible women. But Dr. Tabor is going to close out Black History Month, and he is actually uh, Black history himself here in Los Angeles. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Greg. Stephen, did you want to say anything or you want to wait to the end? All right, Greg, back to you. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, yes, today uh, we have an individual formerly known as Danny Tabor, who is now Dr. Daniel Tabor, and he is an experienced executive director with a demonstrated history of working in the community development industry. He's skilled in nonprofit organizations, budgeting, grassroots organizing, government and urban planning. He's got a strong economic development professional experience. He has a master of science and focused in organizational leadership, management, and from, uh, from Springfield College. He's currently an adjunct uh, faculty member at uh, Los Angeles uh, Trade Tech and uh, Los Angeles Community College District. 
He's also served as executive director at the Los Angeles Southwest College Foundation, uh, where he specialized in organizational leadership, fundraising, program development, event management, board relations. He was with the city of Inglewood. Inglewood! That's right, I'm a resident of Inglewood, so proud <laughs> member. He was a mayor and councilman, and he was there from 2006 to 2011. Uh, it, he uh, went to California State University, Long Beach College of Education, and that's where he has uh, completed his EDD, and he will differentiate the differences between a doctorate of education, EDD, and a PhD. I think the PhD lends you more towards teaching at a university, and the e EDD, I believe, is more working within the education uh, field, but he will, he will delineate that and, and extrapolate on that. Uh, a, a little bit more as he uh, gets in here. Uh, he is, uh, did you, were you born in Inglewood? I was born in Marshall, Texas. Marshall, wow. Texas. Okay, I thought I remembered something good there. But you were raised here in, in, uh, in, in, in Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's going to, uh, uh, he's going to share with us some of the information. I'm going to read just a little bit of it, uh, of an abstract of what he did which was, he said, this was the qualitative interview study explores the beliefs, feelings, and opinions held by the staff, faculty, and administrators who operationalize the Umoja student support programs on campuses within a California community college district. I have no idea what that means, but he's going to let us know. <laughs> he's going to explain that to us. <laughs> That's the Dr. Danny Tabor, the Daniel Tabor. Danny Tabor is a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi uh, fraternity, and uh, and he will be sharing information with us um, of his uh, studies and how that relates to the community. So, without further delay, it's my pleasure to bring to the virtual stage Dr. Dr. Daniel Tabor. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you very much, Crystal and Greg and um, and Stephen. And I, 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 where is where is our our fourth? Robin, Robin is uh, at uh, she she goes through chemo, but I think she's at the doctor's today. But she says she will be listening in, so she's here. So right. say hello to Robin. She's here. <laughs> hey, 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 Robin. Hey, Robin. And, and I've probably known Robin longer than I've known the four of you, but we go back uh, to our times in the nineties. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe even to the 80s. Um, uh, and I want to mention Muhammad Nasruddin, the, the founder of Recycling Black Dollars, because it's appropriate that we do that in space. Uh, I see a number of people who are affiliated with uh, the what, what is known as the California Consortium of Public Health Informatics and Technology on the call. So that's good. I, I want to spend most of my time today talking about CFIT, but more importantly, talking about what we are doing in, in CFIT. Um, but I'll start talking about the doctorate program because I'm, uh, as I was sharing before we, we jumped on, it was not in my uh, career pathway or pl life plan uh, to, uh, uh, to enter the doctorate program at any stage of my life. Um, I had uh, worked with uh, Dr. Laura Manyweather as she was earning her doctorate degree and she was convinced that I needed to go back to school and earn my doctorate. And I was convinced that I had no more time and no more energy to, to uh, run any student debt. And as a result of the two of those, I thought I had conceived an appropriate escape mechanism, but Dr. Manny Weather being who she is, uh, committed to uh, bringing folks to the, the highest pinnacle that they may be able to achieve in, in their educational journey, uh, did not let me escape, introduced me to uh, Dr. William Vega at Cal State University Long Beach, who then, uh, a year before I ever really thought about the program, introduced me to the idea. I told him I had some friends who were interested. I took them to the orientation, and at the orientation, he said to the audience, if you all can convince Danny Tabor uh, to enter this doctorate program, we'll have some, some benefit for you. Uh, that benefit turned out that the institution was already thinking of minimizing the importance of the GMAT, but he offered that as a, as a trigger. And folks in the room who I didn't know looked at me and said, so what's your plan? Um, I said, well, I'll, I'll think about it. I left there. Uh, some of you know that I, I wear hearing aids and might remember me when I was wearing 
glasses. So I went to the Department of Rehabilitation here in, in Los Angeles and talked to them about getting some help for hearing so I could hear what my students were saying and see what was on their computers. And in the conversation with the, with the director of the office in Inglewood, um, she said, well, have you considered uh, going back to school and earning your doctorate? And I said to her, it's funny you say that because I'm taking some, some, I took some friends to an orientation last week. And as I'm saying last week, she's saying, we'll pay for it. Uh, wow. And so I did what every good uh, Christian man did. I looked to the heavens and said, okay, God, I guess you've eliminated all the obstacles I had. So I guess I'll be going to uh, back to Long Beach State uh, where I went to undergraduate school and, and indeed uh, two and a half years later completed the doctorate program uh, with uh, the dissertation study uh, that Greg talked briefly about um, looking at the Emosia program. And um, I'm going to segue to that real quick before I get into see it because the, the Emosia program has proven itself not just successful uh, as a community college initiative, um, but as a but as a uh, an opportunity for students who are entering the, their college life uh, to particularly African Americans targeted at African American students, but it's open to any student. The Emosia program has worked to successfully um, allow students to succeed, to, to complete their, college, their community college education, to transfer successfully, uh, and to enter the workforce in greater numbers than any other student support program in a community college setting. And I wanted to understand not just what the student experience was, as other researchers have done, but I wanted to look at what the people who operationalize the program, what is it that they bring to the program that helps these students be successful. We don't often look to just the teacher or the program director or an administrator, but the reality is in an educational setting, whether it be community college, uh, Cal State University system or University of California system, the people that do more than just teach, the people that support and enable the program to exist have an impact on what the program does. And so that, study that Greg talked about, my study title is actually uh, where Afrocentricity, cultural proficiency and emancipatory pedagogy enables student success is what I short term it, uh, check up from the neck up of the people that operationalize the program and help and allow them to tell me through their experiences, what they brought uh, of their Afrocentric knowledge, what they brought of their cultural proficiency and what they used in terms their educational pedagogy that was, in, in, as I describe it, emancipatory for the students, such, so much so that these students are successes beyond their initial intent, many of them coming to community college just to get a certificate or to finish and get a degree and then transfer to go on to a four year. They're doing that in such great numbers as compared to other African-American students who are not in the program, who have not availed themselves of the program. And so, uh, the hope now is that from my study and, and the other data that's generated that may not, that I didn't include in the study, that I'll be able to influence uh, community colleges to more greatly invest in the Emosia program, in the resources that the Emosia program needs to expand its, its research, its, its, its access to students. And that, that will help then uh, demonstrate that we can uh, successfully educate those who waited um, you know, who didn't uh, excel in high school, who didn't transfer, didn't graduate, immediately go to a four-year institution, who are in these community colleges who receive the benefit of this educational system that is there to support them, to give them a second chance at an educational opportunity um, to be, to then help them move on through their educational journey. Um, I'm, I'm excited that during this process, uh, the gentleman who, he's got Stephen Turner before his name, but I, I'm going to ask him if he would he would change and put his true name up there, Gordata, who I see, um, um, invited me to participate in the, the, the writing of a grant in response to the Office of National Coordination, a unit of the United States Department of Health and Human Services um, that, that sought to increase the number of individuals that could be trained in public health, informatics, and technology so that the United States would be able to effectively respond to future pandemics, much like COVID, uh, that we experience and that we 
that we are, are still living in would be able to effectively respond both locally, regionally, within the state system and federally in real time in order to, ex to uh, increase the uh, success rate of, uh, of, of survival, but more importantly, to increase the ability of communities, particularly communities of color, who were most impacted during the pandemic to respond efficiently and effectively uh, and responsibly at the local level, at the state level, at the uh, federal level, so that there wouldn't be the loss of life that we experienced when, when COVID first came to the country. Thank you very much, Gore, for, for changing. Um, the, the, the unique effort that, uh, that we undertook and I, and I describe it as unique, I'm not self-proclaiming it as unique, but it has been described as unique, is that our consortium is comprised of the University of California, the California State University System, the California Community College System, not for-profit entities like Futura Health, labor organizations like uh, SEIU 721, and other professional groups who are involved in the public health space coming together to construct a curriculum, a curricular pathway, uh, to construct an environment for internships and now apprenticeships within the public health space, such that an individual could, who, could, who could be a high school student or could be a formerly incarcerated individual or could be a current college student matriculating in technology or health or public health or some discipline outside of that, could become interested in doing something, serving their community in a public health space and, and step into that, that educational pathway at whatever point they come in and not only um, achieve either a certificate or a degree or um, within, within the public health space, but that they would also be uh, entitled to a paid internship it would allow them to practice what they've learned in a real public health environment, and in that way, be able to contribute to the benefit, their benefits to their community um, here in the state of California and nationally. This is the sort of step back a second. The, the ONC and the Department of Health and Human Services funded 10 grantees throughout the country. In California, there were two, the California Consortium, Consortium of Public Health Informatics and Technology, which we are a part of and the University of California at Irvine. The University of California Irvine's program is a single institution effort at increasing the, the benefit of their public health institution, their public health school. And like the other eight grantees around the country are single entities where they brought in partners to assist them. We were the only consortium to apply as a consortium, meaning we, were, we went through the process of discussing not only what we wanted to do, but what we, needed to do to work together, to collaborate, to, to organize, to, to synthesize the skill sets that we could bring, the knowledge that we could bring. We were committed from the very beginning um, as, as to ensure that a student could matriculate from high school through a doctor, post-doctorate educational experience in the program that we created. And we wanted to respond more specifically to the Office of National Coordination's commitment, uh, or actually I should say intent, was that you had to be a minority serving institution to apply and you had to target underrepresented populations that you identify to receive, to target towards the training that you would provide through your curriculum that you created. And so in, in CFIT, what we've done is articulate specifically that in, particularly from our California experience that our underrepresented populations include the black African-American community, the Asian, Asian Pacific Islander community, the Native American First Nation community and the Lat Latino, uh, Lat uh, Latino communities of, of Southern California and throughout the state. I guess the point I wanna make here is that we are a statewide consortium and we seek to serve those underrepresented communities both locally within specific neighborhoods and zip codes, but also regionally and then throughout the state so that, that students um, may, can, students and incumbent workers and others can come to us from wherever they happen to be and participate in this educational process with the 
with the expressed intent that we're putting people at the end of it to work in public health and public health informatics in, in public health informatics and technology. And I say it in that way because the, if, you, if you pulled up Indeed right now or, or whatever job platform you go to, you will have difficulty finding a job entitled public health informatics, where there, you know, somebody says, I'm looking for um, uh, someone who has public health experience and who has the ability to crunch data and to analyze data. So what types of jobs are we talking about? We're talking about the folks who did the contact tracing uh, when, you were, when it was reported that you, you had presented and, were, and had COVID. They we're talking about the folks who collected the data on a door-to-door -door basis in communities and at community events and from, from health agencies that did the reporting of how many people presented and were diagnosed with COVID. That data goes into, into a system where an analyst organizes and separates the data demographically, uh, separates it on, on types of incidents, locations of, of contact, and all the way through the people who do that basic introductory uh, information gathering to the people who do the analysis, to the people who then present that analysis and format it for presentation uh, to the elected bodies, to the governmental bodies that have the responsibility to draft policy, all the way to the folks who are drafting policy based on the historical impacts and imprints of that data. So all of these are public health, informatic, and technology occupations that we take for granted, but that are here and, and in our first few weeks of, of development around our, our application and our conversations with folks like the California Department of Public Health, we heard from them say that if we had people with these skill sets, we could hire thousands of them today and deploy them today. So we know there's a real job. We know this is a real, real career path. And we know these are jobs that are beyond just livable wages, but real tangible um, quality of life uh, earning occupations that are trans transferable in a variety of different, different spheres. Folks like Kaiser will use these. Departments of Public Health will use these kind of individuals. Um, um, Div uh, Divinity Health, uh, Altamed, um, the insurance companies have people who do the analytic, who, who are crunching the numbers, who are identifying what data they need and analyzing that data and making decisions about how to invest, how to deploy their resources. We want to make sure that our communities, our underrepresented populations in California, have an opportunity to be trained to earn these jobs. And so I'm, I'm thankful we're joined by, by Dr. Jeremy Ramirez, who's at, uh, who joined us recently, part of the consortium, um, Dr. Boradada, who's, who's on the call, who, who, as I said, brought me into the effort, uh, and perhaps even others. I'm, I'm only seeing those, those few names here, that where we're working to, to um, or organically create in an academic environment with external folks who are not part of the academic community, but help inform and influence what we're attempting to do, an opportunity that is a lifetime career changing opportunity. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about it today on Community Brief. Thank you, Danny. Um, what, um, what locations or what, what schools, universities are, are participating in that? I know that you're at um, uh, LA Trade Tech. Um, so, so let me, let, let this is probably a good start. So I teach, and this is, this is yeah. an interesting um, uh, topic that we're still working through. So I teach at Los Angeles Trade Tech College. I'm, I also teach courses in, and I teach in the business department. So let me be real clear there, at Los Angeles Trade Tech and at Los Angeles Southwest College. I'm sitting in my classroom right now at Los, Los Angeles Southwest College, and a couple of my students are, are here in the background. Um, um, but the campuses that are involved, UC Berkeley, uh -huh. California State East Bay, California State Long Beach, um, and, and then the community colleges are uh, Shasta Community College up in very, very far effort in Northern California, Saddleback Community College down in Southern California, uh, East Los Angeles Community College and Long Beach City College are the institutions that have that faculty from those institutions have participated in developing the curriculum. Uh, and I think I've left out a few others that that are also Bakersfield, Bakersfield. State, but we're we're statewide. Gore, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said Bakersfield Community College. Bakers, right. I should. I got to say Bakersfield College because they're the the lead community college district that is organizing the community colleges space. 
And we're developing the curriculum so that it, it, it will be virtual, be online, so that students at, at one campus, if a course is not offered, can take the course at another campus. Uh, we've, we've learned in our process that there are ways for community college students to take at least one class free at a, at a CSU or one class free at a, at a UC. Uh, we're hoping to, that that becomes part of our pipeline pathways to help move folks who are seeking a degree. But at the same time, we're working with incumbent workers uh, who, are, who are currently employed in health or public health. Folks who are, for example, the, the long-term healthcare workers union, people who provide in-home healthcare have a unique experience at meeting the needs of uh, the public community uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis in most instances. But imagine if, if they take that skill set and with some technology uh, application are now able to advance their career um, into public health and, and serve a broader population from their personal experiences being a caregiver to their now personal experiences being able to interpret that uh, the caregiving techniques and the data that is generated through their through their uh, caregiving uh, corollaries into an opportunity for them to then uh, provide that data and, and inform folks like Kaiser on how to serve their client population, their elder uh, ge geriatric population and others. So we're, we're, we're looking at, at this as both a workforce opportunity as it was envisioned. Uh, we're beginning to work now with uh, Orange County Workforce Investment Board, the Los Angeles County Workforce Investment Board, the Los City of Los Angeles Workforce Investment Board, uh, seeking from employers opportunities for internships that we will pay for, that we will raise money for in other instances to cover, and that some companies uh, may even have a paid internship opportunity already, but haven't been thinking about their internships in, in, the, in the informatics side. They have, inf they have internships in pharmacy. They have internships in nursing. Here's now an opportunity to create an internship uh, for an underrepresented student to learn and to demonstrate their value to that company in public health informatics. Can you repeat how is it funded? Where does the funding come from? So our funding comes from the Office of National Coordination, United States Department of Health and Human Service. It's a federal grant. Uh, we were, again, one, one of 10 recipients around the country. That's fantastic. How do we get high school students uh, geared towards that. I mean, you know, getting the information and then, and what ages are too young, you know, just speaking of high school, I mean, is, do they start getting some semblance of it maybe in middle school? You know, where, where does it start? Where does it begin? So we, we actually, that's what we're developing now, Greg, where we've completed uh, the curriculum development. It's designed to be at a foundational basis to target high school students as both informational uh, and career orientation. Um, it is, it is, uh, we've, we've not yet started doing presentations to high school students. We've had one opportunity to, to in, in Orange County to sit with um, a, a high school uh, that brought its students into a workforce center and to begin talking to them about this career. And so we're using that experience to help better refine our messaging uh, for high schools. We've, we've not yet completed the design of our landing page. That's that we should have in the next 30 to 60 days, both for the foundational curriculum, but also for the program at Long Beach. Um, Jeremy, would you put our, our website uh, location at Long Beach in the chat for folks? Uh, and then I'll call it out once I see it. Um, but I, I typically will, would say you could Google uh, the California Consortium, Consortium for Public Health Informatics and Technology. Uh, it will lead you to uh, the Long Beach State website. Um, if you Google, Public Health Informatics it leads you to the Center for Disease Control that talks about public health informatics. Um, there, there are, uh, and Gora, I might ask you to name some of the other funded partners around the country. Um, and, and, and I'm glad that you all are able to be on this presentation with us today. My, my, my purpose, my desire today is that there will be interest from those who, who, who regularly sign in the community briefing that will get questions about how they can participate and that will then be able to respond with, with more detailed information for their organization that were asked through presentations. Um, for, for example, and this is, this is key here, we've reached out to, to an organization called Community Build. I believe you, you guys have had, had uh, Community Build present. And during the, the, the initial years of COVID, 
They were contracted by the County of Los Angeles Public Health Department, and they had people out on the street who were passing out PPEs, the mask and the, the hand sanitizers, and informing folks about what they could do to um, prevent their contacting the disease. Well, we see those individuals now who are now unemployed because the grant for that, that those individuals have run out. We see them as a primary target of recruitment for our work because they have public experience. If we could then provide for them the, the foundational information about public health as a career, provide for them the technical aspect of working in with, with um, Python or, or with Tableau, the software that's used to generate and to crunch the data in the public health space, then they might choose to continue on in a public health career. Uh, they could be picked up by either the county who needs to continue to do outreach around uh, not just um, COVID, but also AIDS, but also uh, the other, you know, uh, the other emerging um, health issues that are coming up in our community from in everything from air quality issues to, to um, uh, water issues, and be able to then turn that into uh, not just a, a job, but a career that has them working in the public health space. If they choose to go back to school, they can take that information, use that. We, we have uh, credit for prior learning as part of the curriculum opportunities so that they may qualify and be able to transfer their, their working knowledge into a credit environment so that they don't start school as a, as a freshman, as most of us did, but may start it as a junior, depending upon their level of background and their knowledge and the amount of credit they earn towards uh, that they use the transfers from their, their work experience. Um, we know that the, we've developed a, an articulation relationship between UC Berkeley, the CSU system with, at East Bay and Long Beach and the community colleges that we work with so that we know that our students will be accepted into those institutions as they continue along their public health path. So this is the work we, we've done. And um, hey, Robin, and, and we'll continue to do in this space is, is, is our effort matures. It's a four-year grant. We're in the, the early, I think we're what first quarter for first quarter entering second quarter of our second year so we're we're on a quarterly basis trying to make movement and steps along the way one of the questions is here is the la orange county regional consortium of 28 community colleges are they involved in the endeavor so they've been we've not yet presented to the full consortium we're talking to members of the consortium we actually have wanted to work with their they have a committee that is focused on health on health careers, and we want to work through that committee to, to reach out to the institutions that offer it. Not what we learned is not every community college or not every university for that matter offers, offers courses in public health towards a degree in public health. Only a few campuses do. And we're we're as we understand who is involved and who is who's already identified public health as a as a, um, a curricular pathway then we're beginning to reach out to those institutions to encourage them to get involved. In this. It, uh, the, I'll, I'll say this this way as politely as I can. In uh, higher education, like in other industries, there is competition amongst the players. And so faculty at each institution have the right to design the curriculum and must approve the curriculum that's being offered. So we've worked to, to uh, integrate our effort into that um, that cultural environment, and we're now finding faculty that want to um, to to push the boundary, as as you might say, to expand the envelope to allow others to engage in the courses that they've helped create. Um, the The creative license, um, Creative Commons license, is one of the tools that we're using. Some of you may be familiar with that in the in the film and music industry. That, that when you collaborate on the creation of content, that that ownership of that content is shared by everybody, all of the collaborators. And so we're moving through that process as well. But that's, that's what happens when you're, when you're, you're a unique organization, uh, creation of, of desire, not of, of, of intent. And that we, we, we've, you know, we've hit some walls and we've learned to climb through those walls or climb over those walls or find a way around those walls uh, as we've created the, the, the curriculum and we're now creating the, the, the uh, internship pathways. It sounds like a lot of data. Now, does AI assist with it? Or, I mean, you know, a AI is artificial, and but somebody's got to figure out what data to, what data should we be collecting? And yeah, then, it, we, AI may be a tool that we use to collect data or to help analyze data, but it will never replace the human 
touch of, of talking to someone, asking the right questions, being empathetic. Interpretation. Um, mm -hmm. Presenting and interpreting the data to the audience that needs to hear it. I mean, can you imagine AI trying to explain to the state Senate or the state health committee uh, in Sacramento what the needs are in Watts or in South Los Angeles of folks who contracted uh, COVID and are now seeing themselves continually back in the hospital or back in their health care providers because they continue to see uh, COVID um, contacts or, or some of the, the side effects of COVID beginning to show themselves. So, no, we, we will always need uh, a, a human presence in this process. And why not folks from our community being trained to provide this service, uh, being becoming the professionals who are, who are analyzing the data and presenting the data to, to our legislators, to our healthcare providers, to our insurers, um, that's that's the opportunity that's here. But let me let me take it another way. And 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 again, I, I mean on Gora, who who's um, who who made the mistake. You know, I, I'm joking here. He made the the right call by introducing me to his wife, who at the time was in India working for uh, the the World Health excuse me, World Health Organization, the World Bank. And um, from that relationship. I now clearly see the opportunity we have in our community to expand what we do in CFIT internationally. Gora Dada is one of our principal investigators. The other is Kami Arale, who is the head of health, health sciences at Cal State University, Long Beach. Gora and I met Kami and, and recruited him to join us in this effort. Come to find out as we recruited him that Kami is an internationally recognized expert in responding to AIDS and AIDS impacts in communities around the world and countries around the world has served as not just a medical practitioner, but a, but a tacticianer on how to set up an appropriate response to AIDS and the AIDS epidemic. So we're blessed to have his background, his experience. His brother's also a medical professional with that similar experience. And we're, we look at what we do here as a beginning, as a, as a foundation for what we hope to be able to carry um, the, in the collaboration in this consortium around to other, other countries on the continent of Africa, in the Caribbean, in Southeast Asia, that have the same type of health needs and have the same uh, need for a collaborative response, consortium of responses that, that bring to their communities, their countries, um, these skill sets and, and training. And, and as we know, with, with, with COVID came this, this thing that we're using today, this virtual experience of sharing ideas, and it really picked up. Uh, now broader platforms than just Zoom, here's an opportunity to teach and to share uh, and to experience what we have in, in many ways, in ways that as, as you know, as a as young black child growing up in Los Angeles, I wanted to, to, to see the world. Now I truly have an opportunity to be a part of not just seeing it, but doing something about it while I'm, while I'm still here and present in this month. That's a great point because the, the, the platform of the, you know, video conferencing uh, just in the, a few short years, you know, gives that platform for um, uh, academicians to, to collaborate, you know, in different, yes. you know, different universities where you can talk to somebody in Northern California uh, much more effectively than you could yeah. just three, four years ago. So well, one of the benefits I had at, uh, early, uh, early in COVID was to be able to, to create an opportunity for, for then Congresswoman Karen Bass, now Mayor Karen Bass, but as in her role as Congresswoman, to meet with the physicians in in uh, Ghana, in, in Mozambique, excuse me, in Ghana, in uh, Tanzania, and in Kenya, who were experimenting with new treatments for COVID as it was as it was beginning to show its presence in Africa, who were having success at preventing um, uh, social contamination, the social contact of COVID, uh, and and allow them to inform her. And it was through a virtual medium like this that we were able to put her on a video conference. So, so I know the, the benefit and I, we see the benefit uh, is technology is not an accidental part of our title. It's a responsibility that ONC put on us as part of the grant. And so we, we include technology both from the standpoint of connecting, but also from the standpoint of analyzing and, and the data analysis. And that's, I mentioned uh, Python and, and, and Tableau a second ago, and um, those are the, the two principal programs, but there are others that are used to communicate uh, to analyze and communicate the data that is being generated. Cool. Crystal, over to you. Um, I, this is awesome, uh, Danny, because you're 
health issues in in the in the minority communities is always an issue because we really don't get enough information. I think I read recently uh, they don't even have enough data because the black uh, black people don't participate in clinical trials, and I imagine that also includes the uh, uh, Hispanic and Asian community, which makes it difficult when we go to a hospital and they don't really understand um, our us. Uh, um, our body makeup and 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 how things affect us based upon our cultural experiences. So this is absolutely awesome. You know, I was reading that uh, with our children in, in the the demographics for uh, children enter or young people entering the college system that we as Black people make up only a six percent of the college um, uh, student body is mm -hmm. and and. Um, uh, and I was very surprised, but Hispanics, 46%, they actually lead. How do we get our students, our children into colleges, whether it's junior colleges or, uh, or universities, because we cannot compete if we don't have an education? We can't participate if we don't right. have an education. We even, can't participate, we, right. So, so, so I, you know, now in my seventh year of teaching at the community college level, the thing that I've, that I'm, that I learn and see over and over again is in our community, uh, for at some point in time, I wanna say, and I'm not even gonna guess when it happened, we went from our parents telling us what we were going to do to our parents asking us what we wanted. Um, I know that my Latino students come to school because they've been told by their parents, this is what they're going to do, that education is the way that is going to lead them to the greatest amount of opportunities. I know that we say it in the black community and I know that we, we've been saying it and we have examples of it, but we don't say to our children, particularly our, our, our high school age children, our younger children, it's easy to say, but our high school age children, we don't say to them, not only that you're going to college, but let's talk about what you're interested in and what that means in the context of a major, so that when you come to college, you have a plan. When you come to college, you know why you're there. When you come to college, you know who to talk to about what resource to ensure that you're getting the most out of your college experience. What we're, what we're expecting to find when we start talking to high school students, particularly black high school students uh, and community college students about public health informatics is that they've never heard of it. And so we're gonna, we know that we need to talk about what it is and what it means in very real terms. The, 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 the truth is that we have, a, we have a, a natural opportunity to link, for, particularly for high school age children, this career opportunity to what their grandparents may be experiencing now with the health issues that their grandparents are going through. And to say to them that with this, this type of career opportunity, you have, to do, you have the ability to do something that will create a better environment that can help support the needs of your grandparents or your parents as they get older and yourself. So this is a career that you can see transitions over generations. It's not just something that will happen today and go away when AI takes over, you know, when, when, when all computers, when we're the subject. These are real career opportunities that have a real impact in your home, in your neighborhood, in your church, your school, your college, your university, your campus, your community, your state, and, and wherever. So that we've got to in, in, in the broader sense, we've got to say to students, education is a tool. And if you want to use the tool, you have to have a plan to use it. Like the car. You have a car, you use the car to go from one place to another. You don't just jump in it. Well, some, some people probably do and just <laughs> drive around but with $8 a gallon or $7 a gallon. And that's hopefully stop some of that nonsense. But you have the ability to use that car to achieve, to get to work you know, or to, to go pick up your parents or to do, to do, to run errands. It's a tool. You need to use your education in that same way. How does it get you from point A to point B? How does, you know, what are those points? What are the priority points? How does it get you to the priorities you have in your life? Okay. So it's really a encouragement from all, from everything, from us, from parents. Uh, I don't know what happens in the school. I do have a young man that was in one of my entrepreneur. It was in my entrepreneur program, and when he first came in, he told me straight out, "Miss Crystal, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. I don't see the reason for having college." 
I was like, oh, okay, that's great, but you need a foundation. So he was adamant. I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and he says, Miss Crystal, I have changed my mind. I know that I need college for many reasons, the education, but the network and the information that I do, I will not get outside of a classroom. And I was just so proud of him. I just wanted to hug him because that was, that was a four year journey of me pushing him to understand that college is the foundation for the success of you as an entrepreneur. <laughs> so Kristen, let, me, let, me, let me shake that a little bit. The right college is the foundation, the right. right collegiate environment or experience is the right foundation. We need to make sure, and, and this goes to my point about public education in Los Angeles, for example, um, that we need to make sure that we are protecting our investment. And in that sense, our investment are our children and our home. And when we, when we, in our communities, we say, well, that school down the street is not functioning, not funny, so I'm gonna send my child across town, that's, Ignoring the fact that that school and its performance, its standard, its rate of performance has an impact on your largest investment, which is your home, which determines the value of your real estate that you are investing in on a daily basis. So we can't afford to just walk away from schools because they're not performing. We've got to find time to re-engage and re-activate uh, our interests in that local school community. Likewise, in mm. a college setting, you hear a lot now talking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, the other part of that that's left out of it is belonging. We need to make sure that our young children, our, our African-American students in particular, and Latino males follow right along in this path, that they understand they belong on the college campus. This is a place for them, and it has something for them, and that it's incumbent upon them to begin to push around and walk around and see what it can offer and come away with, and be engaged by people who are concerned about their belonging just as they are um, in that broad sense. The other piece of it is that we dissect a little bit. Yeah, there's diversity and yeah, there's inclusion, but equity is a, is a unique word that has been glossed over. Equity is, in an educational sense, is those who have less, those who need more, get more because they have less. And if we're not, it's not just spread out. We got a thousand dollars. We're going to chop it up in four ways and give it to each population. It's dividing those that thousand dollars into the pots that serve the most in need in those populations, so that we bring the bottom up to a to a, a, a mid level, so that everybody's in the middle. Now we can talk about equity where it's just easy to spread it out. But in, as long as we have people who are underserved and under under resourced then we can't have true equity unless we're addressing their needs first and with priority. Um, final point on this is Dr. Lewis King, who used to be head of the Fanon Center at, at Drew University of Medicine Science back, back, back in the day. Um, when I started my doctoral program, we had lunch. He told me about an initiative and gave me some work that he had begun that I hope to continue on in the space called intentional critical civility. Intentional critical civility. And what that is, is that we establish in our communities, in our families, in our schools, in our homes, an intentional desire to help people be the best that they can be and not accept anything less. The critical aspect is that we, we, are, we use the critical eye, the critical thinking skills that we have to organize the systems that young people interact with, their educational classroom, their educational school setting, their community setting, to organize them to be critical but supportive in that criticism of what the young people need, that we have a role to play in it. So that the barber, the gas station attendant, the liquor store owner, the church, the pastor, that they're all a part of the educational community of young children in our community, and they have a, a role and responsibility to play. But more importantly, that the family sees to it that they are participating in a child's education and as the school sees to it that they reach out and incorporate the family into the child's education so that the ecosystem that is created is intentionally critically supportive of the needs of each individual child in the collective sense, growing that system to be supportive of one another and teaching what we learn, what we hear and read about happens in this notion of it takes a village to raise a child. 
Well, this is the intentional critical civility is the construction of that village. Mm, okay. Uh, Yolanda, Yolanda, you work in that space, encouraging parents and, 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 and supporting parents and understanding the importance of education, right? Right. So we launched um, NAPI uh, 14 months ago, 294 parents and members in the LA region, LA chapter, and we train parents. I just dropped the flyer in the chat and the website link in the chat. Uh, Dr. Daniel Tabor saying everything after my own heart. I'm not American, as you all know. When my children came here, they were eight and 12. Today, my daughter is an astrophysicist, a mechanical aerospace engineer, and my son is a computer scientist and a digital content director of my company. And I say that because I came with a clear mission and a dream that all black children that crossed my path was going to make it. And that's unapologetic. I just, and, I, and I put in the chat, I need all of you right now. There's millions of dollars coming down the pipeline for educating black and brown children. And Dr. Tarb has already told you, our Latinx community is way ahead of us. Let's give you the figures for LAUSD. Our children are at 20% math literate. That's 80% of 30,372 children who are math illiterate. 80% my black people on this Zoom. So, you know, we have big shoes to fill. We have children whose parents are undocumented who now speak two languages, who mm -hmm. understand where they need to get to, who go to school and go to college at the same time, whose parents are learning three languages and we're sitting back and systemic racism in is not going anywhere. We know what white supremacy is about, but we, the black community, must take this by the horns and educate our black children. So I do that every day at the Knowledge Shop. I create readers as leaders. I create Mets, math, engineering, technologists, and scientists. When you walk in here, you have some form of gift. I'm gonna find what that gives. And you might be a rapper. Right. Or you might be a basketball player. By the time I finish with you, you're going to be some Ph.D. physicist somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to show you that you can be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be an entrepreneur because this white man told me in England at 14, he never had to work again. He was 40 years old. He had all the money he made. And I went home. I said to my dad, what's an entrepreneur? My dad said, I don't know. So let's get out some dictionaries and look it up. Let's look up what that word is. And I spent the next 40 years of my career being that entrepreneur because a dad who didn't know how to do it encouraged me in our home to become that thing so i love this community briefing but i need all of you to hold these school districts accountable for educating our children properly how do we have in lausd the asian students are 88 percent in math white students are 72 percent and black children are 12. come on now well, some Come a lot on. of that is parental. Yeah, yeah, school yeah, district yeah. have never programmed to teach not only the, the students, but the parents are probably right. from a, a level of illiteracy. So, Correct. you know, when when we grew up, it was there was co-parenting. You 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 got teaching and instruction from your from your teacher, but your parents were sitting down and going to correct. Greg that doesn't seem to be happening today. Well, that's why we got to go and get them, Greg. We that's can't right. wait that's anymore. Right. We have to go but, and get So Yolanda, them. I have a I have a request. Can can I, we set a time we'd like to come and talk to your students about public health informatics of and technology? Course, of course. Of course. See if we can add another quiver to their to their, I, their I love you too. The, the other the other thing that I wanna that. that I wanna say to you, say to everybody here is we say college and let us let us let us think about what we're doing. We're, we're accepting the definition of a term that an occupying oppressive environment has created. But the term begins much earlier in our history, right? There were universities and colleges and students and study groups in Kemet, right? So if we think of college in the context of community, then we teach all the time, everywhere we go. We ride the train, we teach. We get on a bus, we teach. We're in the supermarket, we teach. We are educators in every experience that we have with one another and communicating what we know. We're sharing information. We've got to, that's got to become part of us, part of who we are, what we do. So in our effort at, at, at CFIT, we're looking at, for example, I, I work through Futura Health. Futura Health is a, is a nonprofit 
allied health training entity that was created to increase the allied health population of non of underrepresented peoples throughout the state. They 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 come at it with the belief that if somebody can just hold a conversation, they can be taught a, an allied health skill. I mean, it's that that basic and simple. And so we want to we we created a foundation foundational course that leads to the the um, credit courses and on the non-credit side that leads to the credit courses on the four credit side that if you complete the basic foundation, you have an understanding of what you can provide in the health professions at an allied health level, at a professional health level. You then can make the choices you need to make to continue on in the formal educational process or to work in community-based organizations or to, you know, to have a hut outside in Lemur Park and just sharing nutritional information. You become an educator. I mean, it's, it, it is that basic and that real because public health is all of us. And we've got right. to see it in that light. I mean, we're, we're in the, we're the California Consortium of Public Health Informatics and Technology with a curricular pathway that begins on the non-credit side and continues, as I said, all the way through the PhD, EDD. And by the way, Greg, uh, PhD, for those of you who have one, that means you philosophize on what it is. On the educational <laughs> doctorate side, we're the doers of what needs to be done. Just, just letting you know how we roll here. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Yolanda. The definition piled higher and deeper. <laughs> One's public high school diploma. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, Mary, I'm going to have you and Yolanda, I'm going to have you close out and then we're going to close out. We want to thank you so much, Danny. Uh, I'm glad that you're whole team pushed you to get your doctorate. It I seemed am. like it was destined for you to do. Even though you were kicking and screaming, they weren't going to let you worm, squirm out of that. So no, no, no. Uh, kudos to them for being an amazing support team for you. Uh, Mary, you had a, a quick question and then Yolanda. I just wanted to know, uh, do you know if Cal State Dominguez Hills has the uh, public health degree? They, they do not at the present time. There, there is a plan for them to, in, to begin an undergraduate program in public health um, oh, towards a bachelor's in public health. Um, uh -huh. they, 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 those students at Cal State Dominguez Hills so, do have the opportunity to take the courses that, are, that will be offered at Long Beach or any other CSU and work towards a degree or a certificate in public health informatics. Okay, that's great because I'm, uh, yeah, I'm active with a group out there, part of the Africana Studies Department, and we yes. are working toward the uh, grad, uh, increased graduation and numbers of African-American students uh, who are actually in uh, African studies and uh, would like to branch off and see them in other majors like public health. So that, that would be a good thing. We'll, 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 we'll work on that. Please reach out. I'd love to come talk to you, you all, and the students, faculty there, about how this, how we can begin to collaborate around curricular development. Um, I, I saw there's Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, can you put your number in the chat as well? Because I, what I'd like to do is, as they're thinking about it at Dominguez, is get Sarah and uh, and and I when we're working on the non-credit side, and you to talk with them about the the. the the co-student experience, but also the curricular development. And uh, Mary, I'm going, and Data, if you put your information in, but Mary, I'm gonna, uh, in, uh, if you put your contact information into the chat, I would like to introduce you to uh, someone over at the Los Angeles Urban League. They do a massive outreach to uh, graduating students in Los Angeles. And I'd like to introduce you to Jamika Marshall, who's the VP of programs over there and see if you guys can and speak that most of, uh, you know, our, our, we have several youth entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur programs and education educational and tutoring programs that come through uh, the Los Angeles Urban League. Okay, great. So Thank put you. that through. Yolanda, we're going to close out. We're about to, we're at 12 o'clock, but I'm going to let you uh, do the last question. And then uh, uh, Stephen, uh, you uh, just quickly, Yolanda, Stephen, who's here next week? Next week, we have Dr. G, otherwise known as Dr. Giovanni Brandfield. Talk about the construction field women, diversity and inclusion.
Okay, so we're kicking off Women's History Month next week. We want you all to come back, bring all your powerful women and refer those some of those over to me, uh, to, uh, to us. Uh, we have this platform and I have the community briefing. We just really yeah. want to highlight and celebrate women to, uh, uh, throughout the month of uh, of of March, but we want to be able to do just like Black History, 365 days a year, yeah. uplifting those of us that are doing and working hard in our industry and in our craft uh, to make a difference for our communities and for our children. Yolanda? Okay, thank you, Crystal. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, my question and my comment are too long to really go into, but one of the things that I have found in in continuing to work with LA Unified is that black students are looking at those areas that are glamorized, such as rapping and uh, sports, because that's the way out for them. So going to college is not as important as we think it should be, because they're looking at a quick, easy, fast way to get out of whatever their circumstances are. So we're having to really work very hard and with intention on making sure the kids understand that just because that looks good to you today does not mean it's going to be good for you tomorrow. So rapping and, and running that ball boy does not necessarily mean you're going to be the one to do that. So it, it's a definite challenge. I do know about BSAP. And uh, so there's a lot of work to be done in the Black community, especially when it comes to education. I work in an area that tells me black students are almost non-existent. And it's it's really too bad. It doesn't have, it should not be that way. We also focus on getting kids into HBCUs, historical black colleges, and kids need to understand that is also the best way out. If they can't do it here, they can absolutely do it at an HBCU and get everything they want. Awesome. So awesome. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, um, uh, and there, in fact, just as we were talking, someone else outside of even this the Zoom just uh, sent me a notification that there's uh, for the HBCUs, there's uh, for my tennis players out there, uh, there's a $10,000 grant that a scholarship grant that just was uh, published today. Uh, so anyone that has any kids that's playing tennis, um, $10,000 is yeah, goes a long way when we're trying to go right. to college. Absolutely. Uh, Yes, for sure. What and that's through sports, right? Um, uh, announcement before we close out: Phase two of the Los Angeles County grant has been uh, announced. This uh, the information is in the chat. Phase two just opened this morning, and most of phase two excludes LA City, but most of our guests out operate outside of the city and county are eligible to um, apply for that grant. So if they're still giving money, guys, go after it. <laughs> that's what I say. Um, we want to thank you guys and thank you for uh, allowing us to go over for a minute and Daniel, Dr. Tabor, uh, we are just so pleased to have you here. <laughs> Gone from yeah. a politician to Dr. Tabor. <laughs> a future for all of us. <laughs> right, exactly. So we are so proud of you and all of your accomplishments, and we will continue to be your cheerleaders along with Gora. He says he's your cheerleader. <laughs> so you guys are welcome back at any at any time. And I would love to have you on the community briefing in April uh, to also introduce that your program uh, to uh, <laughs> I give you your commencement uh, 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 of music uh, to have you to talk about that program on my other platform as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. One thing, thank you all for the for the opportunity. I want to I want to just say that in Los Angeles, if you live in a city, the United to House Los Angeles initiative was passed in November. It's being implemented, or I should say, it's being dis discussed in council committees. If you should participate, because this is uh, in addition to uh, Mayor Karen Bass's efforts to to address the homeless population, this is a resource that it makes funds available to create affordable housing, to help people stay in their homes and to, to fight evictions, uh, but more importantly, to create resources to serve those people who are homeless that are not now being served. And, and you know, they look like us, so we need to be out there making sure that this program gets implemented as the voters intended it, as, as it was initially written. So 
Thank you awesome. very much. Awesome, awesome. Uh, as everyone knows, the community briefing uh, Brock, uh, is, is here every Thursday at 11 a.m. Please, guys, go over to our uh, YouTube channel and subscribe to our uh, channel. We want to monetize this so we uh, the program so we, that we can continue on. I will put the information in the chat again. We ask that you run on over there to your YouTube to YouTube and uh, hit that subscribe button. We do appreciate that. Hit that button, guys. Uh, we 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 need to have uh, 100 just to get our customized. A YouTube channel name, but we need to have a uh, thousand so we can start. Um, we can start to monetize. So I know now, you guys do can today. do that for us. Do it today. Do, do it, it today. today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this program is powered and sponsored by the Recycling Black Dollars and the Black Business Association. And we, our sponsorship is from uh, Southern California Edison, Wells Fargo Bank, PCR, as well as SoCal Gas and our and the Los Angeles LD. So if you guys want to uh, support us, you can go over to our website, Greg, you'll put that in the chat and you guys can support us with the hit that donation button. We want to be, and I've told everyone, I want this platform or we want this platform to be the black NPR for our community. Whatever is going on in our communities that pertain to black and brown people, we want you to be able to find and hear it here um, first, and then you will continue continue to hear it so that we can become much more uh, connected. Uh, we got to change these numbers, 6%, six percent, <laughs> six hours of dollars in our community, it, 12 hours, uh, 12, 20% of the population that are math illiterate. That's just, guys, we got to do better. Our ancestors said we have to do better. So uh, we're here for you, Danny, however you need us uh, as a committee. Yolande, we are here for you. We have to take control of our own our own community and and be intentional about our support. So I want to thank you, thank all, you all, and we will see you guys next Thursday. You can also check us out on the community. Uh, I'm sorry, the business zone every third Friday at three eight three p.m. Um, we stream live on. Also, uh, social media channels, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, so check us out. I am having guests to talk about the history of Black tennis in America. Uh, so I got um, the the uh, a representative from the American Tennis Association and also a program um, director for Pete Brown Jr. Tennis Player, Dennis Tennis Program, where we have... Uh, six kids right now in college playing on full tennis scholarships, getting educated. And so we are very proud of the work we do. And so come join us tomorrow at three o'clock and hear about the history of black tennis is more than Serena and Venus. Trust me. <laughs> There's a young, young black male tennis phenom playing at Rancho Park on a regular basis, training, being recruited by all the top high schools. Yes. He's a middle school student right now, and they are after him, offering him full ride scholarships. Wow. Yeah. Middle, middle school. I have, we have a child that's at Harvard right now. Uh, her name is Marley. We have one, we have a child that's playing pro. Uh, her name is uh, Katrina. Uh, she went pro when she was 16 years old. Just phenomenal. I have, uh, we have one at Tennessee State. We have one at Howard, one at uh, Clark. So that's our goal is to teach them to play tennis. But in order to get scholarships to go to college, full ride uh, HBCUs or other universities to make sure that they are educated. Whatever tool you need to get in there, that's what we want. <laughs> and so, if you're so, gonna have a racket, that's the best one to have, right? <laughs> right, the, the best one to have. It's much cheaper to go tennis than it is uh, some other sports. <laughs> so, uh, and I we teach really you- Shout out to my cousin Renee, who's been on the call the whole time. That, that other Tabor here is, is, a, is indeed a Tabor. Oh, she is a big supporter of the community briefing. She is here as every week and supporting and, you know, her program ERC. I got one of my clients, uh, $96,000. So I, I love Renee. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a nappy member. Go Renee. Go <laughs> and I have to say one thing about Danny. He didn't tell you his new nickname that the mayor gave him. Tell them. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dr. D. Dr. D. Dr. D. Dr. D. Dr. D. Dr. D. Honorable Karen Bass 
said to him in public. <laughs> Dr. D. Dr. D. D. <laughs> I wear it proudly. And all righty then. So, and we want to thank Jeremy for being here. I, I think the uh, Gora left, but thank you so much. Oh, Joe. Sure. Oh, there. oh, there you are. There you are. Thank, thank you for joining us. Kevin, you came in. We always love to have Kevin in. Uh, another organization that is really supporting and changing, making change in, in, uh, in advocacy for the Black community. Michael, welcome. And um, uh, Mary, welcome. And Joan, welcome. Please come back. And of course, Emma and Jasmine, they're always here. And Renee are always here to support us. And there were a number of others. So let's stay connected, guys, and let's support each other because no one else is going to do it better than we can do it ourselves. That's right. All, That's right. all right. All right. Signing off, guys. I'm going to stop the recording and the live.